who are continuing treated like trash. Our investigation into the 2008 death of 20 year old Amanda Winkowski. Today, we're going to take a closer look at our number one suspect in this case, Antoine Garner. So we hope you'll stick around. Antoine Garner is currently serving an 18 year sentence at Elmira Correctional Facility, which is in Elmira, New York. His earliest release date, according to the New York State Department of Corrections, is February 13th, 2027. Antoine was convicted of four felonies, robbery, criminal sexual act, rape, and strangulation. The Department of Corrections website also says that they only show the four crimes with the longest sentences. So there might be other crimes he was convicted of or pled guilty to. We're not sure. We're working on getting those court records. But for today, we want to focus on those last two listed by the Department of Corrections, rape and strangulation. When Amanda's mom, Leslie Brill Meserol, talked to the mayor of Buffalo, Byron Brown about Amanda's case. She said Mayor Brown asked her, quote, what was a white girl from the suburbs doing in the inner city? Well, that's a good question. Not a terribly tactful or caring question, but a good one. So let's find out a little bit about Buffalo's East Side. And that's why I just don't think Amanda was stupid enough to just to mess with the east side. I just don't get it. Like we were scared of the east side. We knew to be scared of the east side. This is Danielle Winkowski, Amanda's sister. They were both addicted to heroin, so they would often buy and do drugs together. It's just a scary, it's a scary place around here. Like even, even us being street smart and like being like using drugs for years and like being down in the hood, like the west side does not compare to the east side. Like there's shootings and killings and rapings and like just they are not they're just scarier down there like you just knew not to mess with I, I I mean I would never and that was the first thing I said to Adam when he told me he took her to get drugs and she never came back out and I'm like what I'm like what are you talking about he's like I took her to get drugs and she never came back out and I'm like where and he's like on the east side I'm like no you didn't we have no dealers on the east side we wouldn't go to the east side and oh, that's what I did that's what I did she so went in and she never came back out and that's what he kept telling me. And I was just like, we don't know anybody on the east side. Like, there's no dealers on the east side. We don't know anybody on the east side. Like, we don't mess with the east side. Like, that's a whole other ball game. Like, that's just something you don't do. And especially as a young, pretty white girl. Like, you know not to mess down there. You know what I mean? <clears throat> well, you don't know what I mean, but that's how we look at it. Like, you just know it's a scary place to be. And especially as one of us. Like, you, even being as stupid as we are, we just know that you just don't do it. It's just like a common street thing, you know. You just don't go to the east side. Buffalo's east side is a very dangerous place, especially for a person like Amanda Winkowski. And people don't put themselves into dangerous situations on purpose without weighing the risk-reward. Whatever reward Amanda was seeking that night, December 5th, 2008, she apparently was willing to take the risk. And there are a couple of scenarios that would seem to make sense. One of them is that Amanda went to Antoine's house to buy drugs. Amanda was an addict and Antoine was a drug dealer, um, but he didn't deal heroin, which was Amanda's drug of choice. And there were plenty of drug dealers in Niagara Falls that she could have gone to. They were closer to her. She knew them. So why would she choose to go see Antoine under this scenario? It, it's questionable. But we do know from various witnesses that Amanda was acting as a police informant. So it's possible she went in that capacity. Amanda was an addict. She probably had run-ins with police. And she had a boyfriend, Ryan Pacis, who was in jail at the time. And according to her family, 
she believed she could earn a lighter sentence for him by cooperating with the law. Now, here's what Ryan Paces actually had to say about that. So it didn't work. You know, it, what I heard of, it didn't work. They didn't, it never worked towards me. You know, she, she would have done anything to get me out of jail. But they always said, it's not going to work. I'm on a violation of parole. They didn't want me. They wanted, you know, it, it wouldn't have worked. They kept saying, it's not going to, it's not going to work there. It's not going to work to her. And then I let, I let it go. But that's how Amanda was, man. It was a different, it was a different level. It was a different level of, of, of love. I mean, that was, was pure, you know what I mean? Okay, so Amanda found herself in a very dangerous part of town with very dangerous people doing very dangerous things. Things that resulted ultimately in her death. So let's fast forward to after Amanda's body was found and let me give you the 30,000 foot highlights. Amanda was found in a garbage can across the street from Antoine Garner's house on January 9th, 2009. That was 35 days after she was last seen alive. She was frozen solid. On January 10th, Erie County Medical Examiner Diane Verdes conducted an autopsy on Amanda's body. According to reports in the police files, Dr. Verdes left Amanda's body out overnight to thaw her prior to the autopsy. And this is not a proper procedure according to several studies on the subject. What Dr. Verdes should have done was to bring Amanda's temperature down over a long period of time, about a week, in a refrigerator prior to conducting the autopsy. The way she did it, the outside of Amanda's body would have begun to decompose while her organs were still frozen inside. The decision to autopsy Amanda the day after she was discovered is an indication that the Erie County Medical Examiner's office was overworked, understaffed, and hurried. That's my opinion anyway. On January 27, 2009, the Erie County Medical Examiner's office received a toxicology report from the Forensic Toxicology Lab. It reported the following substances in Amanda's body. 12.6 micrograms per liter of cannabinoids in her blood, 0.08 milligrams per liter of morphine in her blood, 0.20 milligrams per kilogram of morphine in her liver, less than 0.02 milligrams per liter of codeine in her blood, less than 0.06 milligrams per kilogram of codeine in her liver, and 0.03% weight by volume of ethanol in her blood and urine. On February 5th, 2009, the Erie County Medical Examiner's Office issued its autopsy report. It determined that Amanda Winkowski died of an accidental opioid overdose. On March 7th, 2009, the Erie County Forensics Lab delivered its DNA analysis report to the medical examiner's office. It found DNA from at least three people inside Amanda's mouth, one of which was Adam Patterson. Amanda herself is likely one of the other people, leaving an unknown male as the third. Antoine Garner's DNA is not found in any of the samples sent to the lab in this report. On April 6, 2009, the Erie County Forensics Lab produced a supplemental toxicology report. In it, they found 10.7 milligrams per liter of gamma hydroxybutyrate in a sample of Amanda's blood, 17.6 milligrams per liter of GHB in a sample of Amanda's bile, 18 milligrams per liter of GHB in a second sample of Amanda's bile. Now, GHB is more commonly known as the date rape drug. June 2nd, 2009, Amanda's mom is advised by a member of a local police agency to have Amanda's body exhumed and examined by an outside ME. She ultimately decides to do it, and the report that she got back said that Amanda was definitely murdered. On June 15th, 2009, the Erie County Forensics Lab delivers a supplemental DNA analysis report. In it, Antoine Garner is matched to a hair found on Amanda's buttocks. A hair from Amanda's back is determined to be from an unknown female. Another hair from Amanda's back is determined to contain DNA from two additional unknown persons. On December 14, 2009, Amanda's body was flown to Los Angeles, California to be examined by a private medical examiner, Dr. Silvia Comparini. 
Her body is accompanied by Leslie's friend, Kathy Webner, and a retired Buffalo PD detective, Dennis Delano. On November 15, 2011, almost two years later, and after multiple legal battles with Erie County, Dr. Comparini finally has access to the tissue samples that Erie County inexplicably withheld from her. Yes, they withheld evidence from Dr. Comparini and fought to keep it from her. Anyway, she issued her autopsy report, finding Amanda's cause of death was manual strangulation associated with blunt force injuries of face, tongue, external genitalia, upper and lower extremities. Okay, so let's get back to Antoine Garner. In the legal world, there's this phrase, modus operandi, or MO. It refers to a pattern of behavior so distinctive that separate crimes are recognized as the work of the same person. And remember, Antoine was convicted, again, among other things, of raping and strangling a woman. But was this the first time he'd ever raped, attempted to rape, and or strangled a woman? The answer is no. The first time we can find Antoine getting caught attempting a sexual crime, it was in the locker room of his North Buffalo High School back in 2002. He was only 16 years old, but he was already six foot three and 252 pounds. In a report, it says he grabbed a 14 year old freshman girl by the neck and shoulder, threw her up against a wall or gate and sexually attacked her. The girl was able to escape and after telling an adult, Antoine was arrested and charged. This wasn't the only time he sexually assaulted a girl when he was a teenager. Unfortunately, those records are sealed, so we don't know the details of the second case. We only know about it because of a footnote in a later case. The third case that we know about happened in October 2008, when a home health care worker named Celeste Cerisi entered an abandoned house with Antoine Garner. She had been brought to that house by a friend, a man, who said she'd be fine and he'd be right back. Then he drove off. Sound familiar? Celeste thought that she was going to a party with other people inside the house, but instead she was raped and almost killed by strangulation. In her conversation with police after the assault, Celeste told them he is going to kill someone. She insisted that the police arrest Antoine Garner, but they didn't. And it's hard to tell why they didn't. The investigation just didn't seem to go anywhere until, just as Celeste said, Amanda was killed. And it was at that point that Antoine Garner was arrested and tried for the assault on Celeste Cerisi. He was acquitted. Now, this is the assault Rick and I have the most information about because we've actually spoken to Celeste. She shared in great detail the story of Antoine assaulting her and raping her. She told us just how she was able to get away. And though we recorded her telling us what happened, we decided not to share it on this episode. She's given us permission to share it, but we just don't think now is the right time. Um, we find her very credible and we believe her. The jury, though, apparently did not. In 2011, Garner was tried and convicted of raping and strangling an unnamed victim. During the trial, she described how six foot four inch, 387 pound Garner lifted her five foot four, 135 pound body off of the ground by the neck. Garner choked this woman until she lost consciousness. Then he struck her with a blunt object. This all happened inside a vacant house. When she woke up, she was on her stomach. Garner was on top of her. After he was done, he left the house. This unnamed victim staggered outside and collapsed on the steps of a nearby home. A neighbor called 911. He was eventually convicted of strangulation and assault. Apparently, the jury assembled for that trial believed the victim more than the previous jury had believed Celeste Cerisi. In 2013, 
Garner pleaded guilty to three counts of third degree rape and three counts of third degree criminal sexual act for the raping and sodomizing of a 16 year old girl and impregnating her. This all came to light when in 2011, the victim filed a paternity suit against Garner when she was 19 years old. It turns out that Garner was raping and sodomizing her between December 2008 and January 2009. This is the time frame when Amanda Winkowski was murdered, hidden, and later discovered. So that's five separate times that Antoine Garner was accused of or convicted of raping, strangling girls and women. Remember that legal term, modus operandi, or MO? Antoine's MO is to rape and strangle girls and women. There's very little doubt in my mind that what happened to all these victims we talked about today, including Celeste Cerisi, is what happened to Amanda Winkowski. Shortly after charging Antoine Garner with statutory rape of a 16-year-old girl, then District Attorney Frank Sedita was asked about the obvious similarities, the MO, between that case and Amanda's. This was his response. When we have enough evidence that is admissible in court to prove a crime has been committed and who committed that crime, we will prosecute. Unfortunately, under New York law, proof that the defendant may have committed one crime, whether it is an assault or a rape, is generally not admissible to prove that he committed a separate crime, such as a homicide. What D.A. Sedita said isn't technically wrong. The problem, though, is that the police were not allowed to conduct a thorough investigation into Amanda's death because they were stopped in their tracks by the district attorney's office when the medical examiner ruled her death an accidental overdose, which it obviously wasn't. At the time of Amanda's death, the Buffalo Police Department and the Erie County District Attorney's Office had an unwritten rule. BPD could only make an arrest if the DA said they could. And we learned this when we found a letter from BPD Captain Michael McCarthy to Buffalo Police Commissioner Daniel Durenda on January 16th, 2013. Sir, Chief Richards and me will be meeting with DA Frank Sedita and ADA James Bargnesi along with several of their investigators this afternoon. We are going to discuss a range of topics that may assist homicide investigations. This meeting was requested by the DA's office following the Buffalo News article that was obviously perceived by the DA's office as derogatory. I respectfully request to speak on behalf of the BPD regarding specifically the arrangement that developed over the years that now has our department requesting when we can arrest an individual. I believe that we must work together, but we have different thresholds for arrest and prosecution. Police threshold for arresting individuals is probable cause. The DA's needs beyond a reasonable doubt for conviction plea. This idea that we would work in unison years ago is something that is necessary, but the pendulum has swung way too far in that we now need their authorization and permission to make an arrest. This must change. We will continue to work together on cases, but they will not dictate how our department operates. I respectfully request permission to change this unwritten policy and alter this arrangement to a more reasonable agreement. I await your decision. Thank you for your time to consider this very important matter. Respectfully, Captain Michael McCarthy. This well-intended arrangement resulted in investigators reallocating their time, effort, and budgets to cases that the DA determined were prosecutable. Everything else was put on the back burner. So for District Attorney Frank Sedita to cry that he can't prosecute a case because he doesn't have the evidence, but it is his office that directly impedes police from conducting the investigations that will uncover the evidence that he needs, would be laughable if it weren't so tragic. Amanda Winkowski, according to pathologist Sylvia Comparini, was strangled and beaten to death. She was last seen entering Antoine Garner's house. She had Antoine Garner's DNA on her body, the DNA of a known rapist and strangler of women. If the police continue to be impeded from doing a proper investigation, we'll never truly know if it was Antoine Garner who killed her. 
and Amanda Winkowski will never get justice. Now, you might be asking yourself right now, what can I do to help? The answer is to join Amanda's army. I need you to go to Amanda's website, treatedliketrash.com. Scroll down just a bit until you see this orange button, which says join Amanda's army. Click it. Then input your name and email address on this page that loads. And then we'll let you know when we need you to take action to help us pressure the DA's office to reopen Amanda's case. And thank you for considering joining Amanda's army. Thank you very much for watching this video. If you liked what you saw, please subscribe to my channel. And if you have any comments or questions, please leave them below.